Good morning, ASI. It is such a privilege to welcome you here to this meeting. You may be seated. And uh, we are about to begin this weekend that I look forward to every summer. And I believe that the Lord has rich blessings for us. And just a reminder that there is live streaming happening on the ASI website. And so for those who aren't able to join us, let them know they can still be a part of this high weekend. And with me is Pastor Scott Griswold, who is going to once again share a little bit about how God is bringing the world to our doorsteps and the opportunities we have to share the gospel. And he will also open with prayer afterwards. Good morning. What an incredibly beautiful day with so much potential. I'm excited to see what God will do through this weekend. Let's consider Thailand just for a moment. My family and I lived there for 10 years. It's very much on our heart. We love the people so much, an incredibly beautiful country. Yet my heart also breaks when I think of Thailand because I know that there are millions of people who have never met even one Christian. They are people who are close to 67 million unreached, one of the largest unreached people groups in the world, yet the door is wide open for the gospel to be shared there with complete religious liberty. As I think of those people, I think, can you imagine if you were one of them, if you were a Buddhist there, who your relatives are Buddhists, your neighbors are Buddhists, your whole country pretty much is Buddhist, and you've basically never seen anything else to consider becoming. They believe in karma, that everything that has happened to them is because of something they did good or bad in the past, and that everything that they do now will be either rewarded or punished in some future life. I will never forget staring into the face of a man who had been a pimp, a trafficker of children into slavery and prostitution. I watched as his eyes just poured with water as he cried, realizing that Jesus had died for people even like him, to set them free, to give them forgiveness, and prevent them from having to experience the punishment for their sins. Doesn't that make you want to share with Thai Buddhists too? The joy is that you do not have to go over to Thailand or learn Thai to be able to share with a Thai Buddhist. Just right over there in Southern California are about 20,000 of the Thai people, and they're scattered around. Where can you find them? Well, if you love green curry and pot thai and sticky rice and mangoes, you probably know. There are Thai restaurants everywhere. Just in this, this place right here, in this metropolitan area, there are 37 restaurants, and they're scattered in little country towns too. Many of the workers that are there come to America just to learn English while they're cooking. So they're eager for a friend, and you would find it very easy to begin speaking a little bit with them, ask about their country, and then offer to practice English with them. Jesus can lead you right to that place and be able to share and to touch their lives. So I want to encourage you to be thinking, to be praying. We even have a whole set of studies that ASI sponsored a few years ago called New Beginnings, Bridge of Hope, special message for Thai Buddhist people that you can find at our website there as well. God has a plan to reach the whole world. Jesus said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. He personally will take it to his heart as you welcoming and loving him as we reach out together. Let's pray. Let's, let's, um, let's stand together as we pray and seek the Lord, asking him to fill our hearts with his love for these people. Father in heaven, you are loving and reaching and caring for every single person in the world today through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you strive with the hearts of the very special Thai people, the majority who do not know their Father in heaven, do not know Jesus' death on the cross, we ask that you would fill our hearts with love, that you would raise us up and throw us into this beautiful harvest that you have brought from around the world right into our neighborhoods, that you will find ways to lead them to the knowledge that they do not have to strive through their own merits, their own good deeds to win their way to heaven that they can be forgiven, they can be transformed, they can die to self through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you will finish your work, and we ask that we might be right in the center of that as you finish it up 
and we see Jesus return. Please bless this meeting now. Pour out your spirit on Elder Morris as he preaches, on those who have a part. Fill us and speak to us exactly what you are wanting to say throughout this convention that we might go home and be a channel for your blessing. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Good morning, ASI. This is another Offering in Action segment, and you'll remember that we're highlighting projects that we are supporting in this year's offering. And I want to give a little test. I think most of you were probably here last night, and there are three words beginning with E that we want to consider as we uh, think about these projects. What's the first one? Uh, uh, that begins with E. <laughs> So let me, maybe not in any particular order, but we want to enlarge the territory, we want to help enhance their capacity, and we want to encourage them to keep doing the work, okay? Enlarge their territory, um, in, enhance their operations or their capacity, and encourage them to continue. So let's see how we can do that with this particular ministry. This is Randy Bivens. Randy Bivens is the Chief Operating Officer of Weimar Institute. And um, Randy, for those who may not be familiar with Weimar, give us a little bit of background. Um, let me just tell you quickly uh, what Weimar Institute is. For 38 years, we have been healing a hurting world. We have the New Start. In fact, New Start is, is our brand name. If you guys are using New Start, you probably should send us a royalty. Uh, but we, we have a New Start program, which is an 18-day program. We have been full to capacity for well over the last year. Um, in fact, we just did 31 people, and our capacity is like 27. So we are renting out closet space, not, not really. But we, we do lifestyle programs. We have a, a college. We have an on-campus academy, an on-campus elementary school, a, a, a vegetarian you know, cafeteria. And we serve the community in the area just north of Sacramento in California. So this particular project for this year is to um, increase your capacity as far as housing is concerned. Why is that a need right now? Well, we, um, starting last year, the state of California authorized us to start a nursing school. Um, the BRN, the Board of Registered Nurses for the state of California, mandates how many faculty you have. And currently we have two PhD and three master's qualified faculty that we didn't even have a year and a half ago. And so, and the college is continuing to expand <clears throat> and we have a tremendous need to provide housing because housing is very expensive in the surrounding community. And so we're in the process of building a, a, another um, fairly large duplex on campus. And we just thank <clears throat> the SI family because for a number of years you've been supporting our projects and this is this project and we're just excited about it. Now this is particu <laughs> particularly significant and just exciting to me. I remember being back at Weimar uh, several years ago <clears throat> and recognizing that uh, Weimar has not always been sailing on smooth waters. So God has really yeah. blessed. When I started as a chief operating officer three years ago, we had a $3.2 million debt to Amazing Facts, and we were not even able to balance our budget. In fact, I remember our first board meeting, people, the board members were saying, well, how are you going to deal with this debt? How are you going to deal with this debt? And I said, we can't even balance our budget. How can you talk to me about servicing a debt? I said, the problem is, and this is a problem with a lot of ministries, they get mired down in the problems. They need to focus on the problems. And I said, we need to give God this problem, and we need to focus on our mission. Amen. If you're focusing on your mission, God will take care of those problems. And I said, let's focus on our mission. Our mission is to heal a hurting world, and let's give this debt to God. And I told Debbie backstage just a bit ago, the very next day, we were still in board session, and we got uh, our HR director, who's also an attorney, Jonathan Zirkel. He probably, he's out here somewhere. Jonathan brought a letter in from a probate attorney in Reno, Nevada. We had had a guest who had come through New Start about seven years before, had passed away, had left a quarter of his estate to Weimar Institute, and his estate was worth $8.2 million. Amen. Amen. Wow. So that is true. If we stay focused on the mission, if we support these ministries in their mission, God will take care of those distractions that the devil puts on our path to try and derail us from doing what God wants us to do. What other exciting things are happening? Well, the, the amazing thing is, and you know, we, we, everybody focuses on, on, on your balance, your, your budget. We're actually applying for accreditation for the college. Now, that seems like 
um, a bit of an anachronism to have a nonprofit applying for accreditation because a lot of issues with accreditation and Ellen White statements. But if we don't get accredited by 2020, the state of California is not going to allow us to continue to exist as a college. <clears throat> so we've we've been um, applying for Western Association of Schools and Colleges. Is we've already achieved eligibility status, which actually is the first time a, a nonprofit educational institution that achieved this status. In October, we're we're expecting to get um, candidacy status, and at that point, our credits will completely be transferable to other colleges. But in that process, that costs money. Just the accreditation process is probably going to cost upwards to a million dollars. Um, but if we don't do it, we have to cease, cease existing as an educational institution. But part of that is we have to have a balanced budget for these accreditation bodies. And God has gone before us. This last June was the end of our fiscal year. And we ended the fiscal year healthier financially than in our entire 38-year history. Amen. Amen. So this is, this is remarkable to see where Weimar can be truly the head and not the tail. That's absolutely yes. right. And you give know, opportunities for people to come and not just learn a curriculum, but learn about Jesus and that's service. That's exactly right. We, we have, um, in our college, we have natural science degree. People can apply for a degree to then go into medical school and to the date. 100% of our students, and it's like 13 or 14, it's not a big number, but 100% of our students who have applied to medical school have actually gotten in. Amen, amen. That is no small, no. That's no small feat. I, this is wonderful. I'm really excited that we have the opportunity to continue to help Weimar, and thank you for sharing with us all the things, all the opportunities that we have in order to um, enlarge your territory, enhance your capacity, and encourage you to continue. Thank you again, ASI family, for continuing to support Weimar Institute and in our, in our purpose in healing a hurting world. Amen. Thank you, Randy. Coming to the podium is now uh, Brad Mills. He directs uh, a, a wonderful ministry, Amazon Lifesavers. Is that right? That's right. All right. Morning, so you're, you're, organ you're um, located in the Amazon. Now, I'm a little geographically challenged, and there may be some of you out there that are like me. So um, let's, let's do a couple pictures where you can kind of roll through where, the, where Amazon Life Service is located and some of the things that's happening there. So we'll start with the first picture. Okay. Yeah, so this picture actually shows you what we see in villages in the Amazon. Um, for those of you who don't know where the Amazon is, the Amazon is a region, actually, that encompasses several countries in the South American continent. Our ministry is based out of Manaus, the capital city of uh, the Amazon state of Brazil. So we run um, a ministry in this area on the Amazon River and the other larger rivers in this region. Um, probably many of you remember the stories of the Luzero boats. And so we're running a ministry, actually the, the next picture might show that, um, of what we're doing in the Amazon area with the boats, in the people. You know, as we advance in technology, Debbie, here in the U.S. and around the world, life has changed so much. And yet the Amazon, it, it's so much the same. Here's a picture of three girls that are actually traveling. This is the much desired family car in the Amazon and the transport and how to get around. So these girls are having fun, but this is the way they get to church or to school or to the health clinic or to wherever they're going to go. This is their means of transportation still in the Amazon. And the next uh, picture shows, uh, gives an example of some of the other ministry or um, program things that happen uh, there at Amazon. In the yeah, Amazon. this picture, it's a different angle. Looking down, this is a young girl that was found in a village that's actually being taken care of uh, by one of the physicians on our boat. We take out healthcare professionals along with um, other professionals from various areas into unreached villages in the Amazon. And we provide medical care principally as our opening wedge into these villages, um, coming in and taking care of them, finding the sicknesses, treating them, doing health promotion, health education, disease prevention, and using that really to reach in and um, church plant in, that, in those areas. So what kind of students um, are involved in your ministry? There are people that you train. Are these indigenous people or other 
professionals? Who comes to Amazon Lifesavers to learn things? Our ministry, we have about 40 full-time volunteers working with us right now. And those are people that come and they are trained in our three-month mission training school. We have a mission training school that we uh, partnered with the Institute of World Missions at the General Conference and with Light Ministries for part of our health education. We put together a three-month training course. And so what we do is we receive people from anywhere in Brazil. Of those 40, I think two of our volunteers are local Amazon people. So the other 38 are Brazilians, mostly professionals. We have physicians, we have attorneys, we have school teachers, we have psychologists, somebody that says, hey, you know, I'm not a healthcare professional. Well, that's okay. Come and use your talents. They're trained in a three-month course, and then they're put in jungle villages to live in thatch roofs and wooden huts, living like the people to reach the people. And of course, the last picture shows or demonstrates the, the real reason or the, the kind of the ultimate goal for service. Yeah, we're working in an area in the Amazon where there are um, more than half a million unreached. In fact, there's a lot of studies coming out today that, that the largest unreached people group in, in Brazil are the river people and the indigenous people in the Amazon, and much of the South American continent is in this, in this area. Um, we're reaching into areas where there are no evangelical churches, no Protestant churches. These people don't have a Bible in their village. They don't have a way to hear of Jesus, and we're coming in with the idea, with the hope to bring them the joy that we have, the reason that we're here. Amen. Now, let's talk a little bit about this year's project, which is actually to um, uh, enhance your capacity it's for students. So it's to provide additional housing. And what will that mean for Amazon Lifesavers? We um, last year inaugurated our new School of Missions building at our administrative base right outside of the city of Manaus. It's located on the banks of the Amazon River. And we did that in partnership with ASI. Um, ASI has helped us in the past for building that and with FE, which is ASI Brazil organization, the Federação dos Empresários. Um, we were able to um, build our building. It was inaugurated in September of last year at the ASI Brazil event. And so we have gone from a capacity of about 12 um, students that we could train each in each session to 40 per session. Um, we have a huge demand. Now we have the ability to train them. We don't have enough housing at this point. So we have written our next project for ASI to partner with us in building more housing for these students that are coming in and being trained as pioneer missionaries to go out into the Amazon. Excellent, wonderful. Now, uh, I know, and we spoke a little bit about um, how some of the challenges that you face, and I'm like, I can't believe that this young man with his wife and their two sons are serving and have served in the last nine years out in the Amazon. Share with us what you, what you told me about um, a reflection that you and your wife talked about a little bit ago. Well, um, Debbie and I were talking a, a few moments ago, you know, we've been in the Amazon for nine years, as I was saying, and a lot of things happen as we're serving day to day, and we stop and reflect on our lives just a bit. Um, I'm a healthcare professional, I'm a family nurse practitioner, my wife's a registered nurse, a dental hygienist, and we, we have a... Uh, potential to make money in the U.S. And, and live comfortable lives. And as we were discussing and looking over what we could have made, after seven years of being in the Amazon, we said, you know, had we been working, we would have made well over a million dollars in these seven years that we're working in the Amazon. And, and we stopped to reflect about it, and you're kind of like, you know, we don't have any money to show for that. And the Lord quickly said to us, now hold on, you've gotten well over that and reaching people, and church planting, and souls in the Amazon. And I've given that money in buildings, and property, and boats. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's Amen. so worth it. Amen. It certainly is. Thank you so much, Brad, for what you and your family and all of the people that are working with you and your volunteers are doing through Amazon Lifesavers. And we want to make sure that we uphold our hands, don't we? All right. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank we you very much. appreciate that very much. Good morning, ASI. How are you doing? Was that a powerful testimony? We are looking forward to the offering on Sabbath. Well, I tell you what, I have three wonderful ladies that are here with me, and we, I don't know if any of you were standing in the registration line yesterday, and you may have heard some music. Did you hear some music? Yeah. You may have heard a testimony of uh, how God brought some very special people here to ASI, and with me on the stage, I have, some, I have three 
wonderful ladies that came on faith to ASI Phoenix. Uh, next to me is Marilyn, and in the middle we have uh, Cookie, yes. Uh, and, and then next to her is Rainy. Sorry, I get a little nervous. And I'm so grateful that you guys came up this morning. Now, I want to ask, I'm going to start with, with Cookie. That's your nickname. Um, and Cookie, uh, tell us, how did God bring you to ASI 2016? Uh, good morning. Um, my real name is Margie Guyton from a beautiful town called Quitman, Georgia. Uh, we wanted, uh, two weeks ago, I read about in the Southern Tide and about ASI. And I said, Lord, I, prom I, I need to go there and promote my book and to talk about the homeless that I feed. This will make my fifth year. And I said, Lord, you, I need to go. How can we get there? And after I prayed, the Lord said, Cookie, I want you to go to Winn-Dixie to your used-to-be manager and ask him, could you sing? we stand and sing uh, to raise the money? Well, he said yes. And so we sang about 50 songs every day Amen. for four days, and we were able to raise $1,300 for registration, car rental, uh, and hotel fare, and gas fare. Now, I, I feed the homeless. I have about a, a nine locations that I feed in, and I need a food truck. <laughs> And we are on, I'm on GoFund.com. Please pray for that. I, um, um, I'm driving a 94 van, you all. It's called Chug-a-Lug. Chug I'm telling you, if y'all get in it, you'll see why. It you can remember like chug -a -lug. A, It sounds like a locomotive train. I had to go to the Dollar Tree. I was so embarrassed and get me a pair of shades one day. <laughs> and... Uh, I tell you the truth. So I need. Praise a, the Lord. I want to get another friend of mine. Is her name is Attorney Shelby Sellers, and she said, "Well, Cookie, you need a food truck." So she put me on there, and so you all prayed that people will respond, and I need your prayers, and it's listed on the feeding the homeless, Margie Guyton. Amen. And I thank God for my cousins that are with me, Rainy, and I've been singing for thirty some years. We didn't even realize we were kin each other till. Uh, my, my uncle's Dr. David Housen that worked at White House, and he said, those are your cousin, and we realized that Marilyn is kin to us. We're glad to have her. We're going to add her to our additional singing. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, Amen. So, so Cookie, you, you went to Winn-Dixie, which for those who don't know, that's a grocery store, okay, okay. in the South, and, uh, and you sang to raise your way to ASI. Yes, I did. And, and the Lord provided. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and now, Rainey, what was that like? Well, you know, uh, 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 they, they, because we sang old-fashioned gospel and we sang a cappella, and, and they don't hear that much, especially people our age. And one day we were standing up singing, and, and someone said, well, what church do you all attend? And someone else said, well, we don't care what church they attend. They are bringing joy to our hearts. They are Amen. receiving our, our souls. Amen. And we, it's just a blessing. Amen. We love it. We love it. And Amen. they love it also. Amen. And I wrote a children's book. I said, Lord, I need your help. I'm just tired of begging and knocking on doors. How can I do this also? And he said, what's that in your hand like he told Moses? And I said, Lord, what are you talking about? He said, remember your little puppy called Teardrop that my grandfather gave me for, for my fourth birthday. And so I wrote the book, you all, in two days. And everybody that has read it is inspired. It's called Cookie and Teardrop Gets Home. Amen. A lady came out the store, and I had prayed last week. They told me on last Friday that they didn't have the funds. The, the attorney's office are my friends. And I said, don't worry. God going to make a way. Amen. So on Sunday, Sunday, a lady got, came out the store. She said, what are you all doing? And I shared with her. And she read my story. And then she said, are you all hungry? Y'all want something to eat? I said, what? Can you afford it? And she said, yes. And she went across the street to Wendy's. And when she came back, she said, Miss Cookie, I'm going to tell you the truth. I want to see that book published. She handed me the $350 that I needed to get the book done. Amen. Amen. Don't tell me there is nothing too hard for God. Amen. My Amen. favorite scripture is Genesis 1814. Is anything too hard for God? Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Is this the ASI spirit? Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. This is really seeing the, seizing the ASI spirit. Thank you, ladies, for coming on faith to ASI. What would you say to someone who maybe they have a dream in their heart, Cookie? 
and, and, and you want to encourage them to follow their dream. Just step out on faith. Take God at his word. Amen. And as I say, my favorite scripture is Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for God? We have not because we don't ask. If you... <laughs> I think they want to hear them sing. Do, do, wait, do you guys have a number for us? We do, we do. I think they prepared something. All right. Okay. <laughs> what, sung from Winn-Dixie? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that to that blessed Rama's land, but he'll guide us with his eyes, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. Marilyn Cookie, Rainey, God bless you. Thank you for being here. God bless you. I'm in trouble. I can't sing. Can you sing? I can't sing like that. Can Michael that. sing? I, I don't think Mike can sing either. <laughs> okay. We're in trouble. But uh, praise God. What a blessing. Amen. God is so good. Uh, this morning we have with us uh, Michael. Michael is, uh, Michael, what do you do? I am an engineer for AT&T in Dallas. An engineer for AT&T in Dallas. Wow, that's amazing. But, um, Michael, I know that's not the only thing you do. You also have a ministry. Tell us a little bit about what is the name of the ministry and what's the focus of the ministry? Uh, the ministry name is Online Christian Services, and our focus, well, our slogan is uh, spreading the gospel using today's technologies. Amen. So you have an online ministry, but, uh, you know, an engineer for the phone company, and now you've got an online ministry. Tell us, how in the world did you get started in ministry? Well, uh, it, back in 2012, I was on a ladder doing some work around the house, and I fell, broke my wrist. I was put on disability, and I was sitting at home doing nothing. And uh, my father come over and said, you know, if you're doing nothing, you ought to be reading the Bible. So um, I took so, my dad's advice. So what, what was your status at that point? I mean, you're sitting on the couch doing nothing, but what was your status at that point? I had been backslidden for two years. Okay, so you, you were an Adventist, but then you had backslidden from that and kind of disconnected, and, and now this injury, and your dad says, read the Bible. Tell us about how it went from there. So uh, I knew my dad was right. The first two weeks, I struggled with this. Um, in fact, I would pray or try to pray, and everything was, um, well, it was a battle. Uh, after two weeks, I uh, finally was able to read 15 minutes, and then I was falling asleep. Mm. Uh, but within two months, I read through the entire Bible. Amen. And, Amen. And uh, through this, I got so excited, so on fire to share the gospel, and um, I started praying about this. I said, God, I, give me a voice. I want to do something for you. I didn't know what it would be. Kyle, what yeah. do you think about that? Give me a voice. What kind of what kind of prayer is that? Explain that to me from a pastor standpoint. Well, well I think it's I think <laughs> I think God was working on his heart and, and he was open to doing whatever he could do to follow God. And I'll be honest, I, I think would you say that falling off the ladder was kind of a divine appointment? Uh, yeah, you know, we <laughs> joked about me being pushed off and <laughs> well. <laughs> So uh, I, I wasn't aware that that was the job description of the angels, but hey, <laughs> you never know. That's right. Um, yeah, knock the legs out from under that ladder. So you're, yeah. you're reading the Bible, God is working on you, and you're feeling like He's calling you to do something. So what, how did that look? Uh, I started getting impressions to do a, a mobile uh, Bible study app. Oh, so you're a programmer? No. No. You're not a programmer? No. But you did an app? Yes. Could I do an app? Wow. 
if I don't God think you could, you. Steve. I, I don't I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> You've got a lot of talent. But yet, anyway, uh, so God, God impresses you to do this app. You're not a programmer, so what did you do? Uh, I did a lot of praying. Amen. Uh, I talked to my brother, who is a software uh, programmer, and um, he pointed me to some software to use. And every morning I would get up, I would do devotion, I would pray and pray and pray, and then go sit at the computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, in about two weeks, I had the first app out. Amen. Amen. And uh, shortly after that, um, well, I, I spoke with Karen Lewis or emailed Karen Lewis, so she gave me permission to use her uh, Bible study series, Lifting Up Jesus. And uh, so I did the first app in English and then did it in Spanish and then German. And then uh, about a month after that was released, I noticed uh, this app has been downloaded 300 times. I think we, uh, amen, praise the Lord. <laughs> now, something about YouTube, you went to YouTube? Uh, that was a little something different. Oh. But whenever I needed help, I would go to YouTube and get help from nine-year-olds telling me how to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, do we have some graphics, Kyle? I think we do. I okay. think we may have some graphics. We'll put them up there. there there's your, uh, your website so, there. So, talk to us uh, just a little bit about how, who is this reaching now? Uh, all right. So, uh, this app, that, well, what the graphic is, is Bible study with me. So, uh -huh. uh, a month after this was out, uh, Doug and I got together and uh, we start putting our heads together and said, you know what, we can make this app better. We can make it to where people can really communicate with each other can do Bible study with each other, Amen. and this is going throughout the world. I've done Bible studies. Uh, well, I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I've done Bible studies with a guy in Ohio. Yeah. Um, several weeks, we were doing studies together every night. Uh, I've spoke to people in Australia, in Africa, I mean, all over the world. How many Amen. countries are you in now? I don't know how many countries. Uh, the graphic that's up right now, it shows where we have... Um, hey, man. Amen. Pinpointed all the downloads, but that does not have the information from the Spanish app. That is just the English version. So, how many downloads has your app had? Uh, over 100,000. Praise God. Amen. All from someone who had never developed an app before. Right. The Lord used you, yeah. Michael. Steve, can God use us when we're just willing? I think God can use every single one of us to do something. Tell me, how can someone sitting here today get involved? Uh, there's a number of ways. Uh, what we have done is we created this in a way to where, um, well, if people have prayer requests, they can ask for prayer requests. Well, we need people that will pray for them. Amen. Uh, also, we have the need of uh, answering Bible questions. Doug and I, we have day jobs. And so, <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day, we start this for the remainder of the day. So, as far as uh, answering questions, we need people to help answer questions. We need um, people that will help uh, facilitate this in just the manner of getting people connected with other people. Michael, what's your booth number? Uh, 306. If you need something to do and you have a computer at home, can go online, go see booth 306. Talk to Michael. He'll tell you what to do. God bless you. Amen. And as we go off, I want you to watch this video reminding us that just like Michael found out, all of us are called, chosen, and by God's grace committed to sharing the gospel with the world. Call, chosen, committed, found in Revelation. God has called you and I into his kingdom, to this movement. He's chosen us from the foundation of the world, Ephesians. It says that he predestinated. That word predestined doesn't mean you were predetermined whether you're going to be lost or saved. That means before you and I were born, you and I were on God's mind. He called us out of darkness and marvelous light. He chosen us in eternity. Why? He chosen us to be a people, a person that will fully represent his character in this great controversy. Called by God, qualified by God, chosen before you were born. Psalms 139, God said, I knew you before you were conceived in your mother's womb. You and I don't have an identity crisis. We are somebody in Christ. We have a high calling. Committed, 
That's what God is asking you and I now. Once we recognize the call that he placed upon us, recognize that we've been chosen, now he needs from you and I a commitment. Are we willing to surrender, to commit my life, your life, to the cause of God? Be called, be chosen, be committed. Good morning, ASI. I have the somewhat difficult um, opportunity of introducing someone to you that most of you already know. Derek Morris will be our speaker this morning, has helped many Sabbath school teacher have a lively Sabbath school class through his Hope Sabbath School. How many of you have been blessed through that presentation? Amen, I can see many of your hands. Um, Derek has a heart for passion. One of his great desires is taking scriptures and putting them to song. He does that with his wife, Bodil. His book, Radical Prayer, has impacted many people's lives. Currently, Derek serves as president for Hope TV, the arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it's our great privilege to welcome Derek this morning to ASI. I am sure you will be richly blessed through his presentation.
Good morning. I'm happy to be at ASI this morning, and thank you for that beautiful music. That's an old British hymn, you know, Charles Wesley, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood. As I was flying here with my wife yesterday from Washington, D.C., I was impressed that I should change my topic for this morning. I hope that's okay. But I brought a gift for you because uh, the topic that Steve Grabner alluded to, the radical prayer, has so changed my life and my ministry. If you've not heard that message, I brought a thousand CDs at the Hope Channel booth, and there's a three-part series DVD. I'd, I'd love you to pick one up, even one to share with a friend uh, who needs to realize that God wants to use us to change the world. Amen? We are not here just to make a living. We are not here just to stay out of trouble until Jesus comes. We are here on a mission. And so before I share the message this morning, I want to teach you a song. I want to thank our AV people for the great work they're doing. We're going to put the words up on the screen. The Harvest, some of you already know it. Some came to me this morning and said, are we going to sing the scripture song from Luke chapter 10, verse 2? And I invite you to sing it with us. Let's sing together. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. The laborers are few. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, into his harvest. Harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. learned it now sing it with us the harvest truly is great but the laborers are few the laborers are few the harvest truly is great but the laborers are few therefore pray therefore pray the lord of the harvest Send out laborers. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Therefore, pray. God's people said? Amen. Amen. You sounded beautiful this morning. And again, I want to invite you to get a copy of the DVD from our Hope Channel booth, The Radical Prayer, because God wants to use you to be an effective harvest worker. And part of my testimony today, as I pray the radical prayer, talking to, to uh, 
People even in the back who are praying the radical prayer like Scott Griswold saying, Lord, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, whenever you want me to do it, I'm available. Amen? Amen. And when you pray that prayer, God will use you in amazing ways. Well, it was uh, April 11, 2016. I was standing in the back of the General Conference Auditorium about to find my seat for worship. And as I was about to move toward the seat, one of the vice presidents of the General Conference tapped me on the shoulder and said, I'd like to talk to you on the third floor. Well, I didn't know if I was in trouble, <laughs> but I found out when I got to the third floor that I was to be asked if I would consider serving as president of the Hope Channel. Now, they knew my heart. They knew that I was a passionate volunteer with Hope Sabbath School for the last eight years, with more than a million people now participating in that interactive Bible study. So they knew my heart. And even in ministerial, where we had started a program called Ministry in Motion to train pastors and elders. So they knew I was committed to the mission of Hope Channel and to the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but what they didn't know is I was very happy in my work in the General Conference Ministerial Association. But when you pray the radical prayer, you give God permission to throw you out into His harvest where He knows you will be most effective. Amen? It's not about us. It's not about how we feel, how talented or strong we are. It's about God, the Lord of the harvest, knowing we'll be, we will be most effective. So I, my first reaction was resistance because they said, take your time, we need to know by 3 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> my wife and I prayed. I called one of my mentors. Some of you may know Dr. Jack Blanco. I love him as a spiritual mentor and father. I said, Jack, please pray for me. My wife and I were praying, seeking counsel, listening. Lord, what do you want us to do? And I was walking into the Hope Channel studio where I would be filming again, not as an employee, but as part of ministerial all day. And as I was walking in, I saw the media screens from Hope Channel Africa, from Hope Channel India, from Hope Channel International, all around the world. And on one of those screens, Craig, I was teaching Hope Sabbath School. <laughs> and on another screen, one of my favorite preachers, Dwight Nelson, was talking to someone, and then the camera switched, and it was me. And the Lord in that moment said, Derek, I have been preparing you for the last 10 years for what I'm asking you to do. You see, when you pray that radical prayer, you give God permission to do what He knows is best. I hope you'll get a copy of that DVD from our booth. We've got a thousand. I don't know if there's a thousand here yet, but there will be this weekend, so make sure you get a copy. Well, that afternoon, I'd been filming most of the day, and Jack Blanco called me. He said, Derek, I was just praying. To be honest, I had no idea what you should do. And as I was praying, the Spirit of God said to me, call Derek and tell him to take the assignment. Well, you say, so did you take it? Well, I'd already felt some conviction, but let me tell you, uh, when a person who walks with God and cares about you calls you like that, it leaves a bit of an impression on you. And then I'm walking through the building, and a vice president came up to me with tears in his eyes. Now, I know this man. He walks with God. I respect him deeply. He said to me, Derek, I have been praying for you today. I want to tell you, the committee is not calling you. God is calling you. Amen. You see, when you pray the radical prayer, it's not based on how strong you are. Jesus said, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. But God in His wisdom knows that you will be more effective where He throws you than where you go by yourself. Amen? Yeah. And so after praying through the day, I went to the board meeting for Hope Channel that night, 
And I knew something was up when I walked in. I said, when does the assignment start? They said, it just started. <laughs> I'm so glad that God put me there because otherwise I would feel overwhelmed. In fact, God led me to a passage of Scripture that I'm going to share with you today. Some lessons that maybe you need to learn too. God said, Derek, because I have ekbaloed you, thrown you out into this position, there are some lessons you need to remember. And those are the lessons I will share with you this morning after we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you that when we pray the radical prayer, when we give you permission to throw us out into your harvest, that you will put us where we will be most effective in your work. That's our desire, to be faithful, fruitful harvest workers. We believe you've called us to be involved, all of us, total member involvement, to do what you want us to do, where you want us to do it. And so as we come to Scripture today, the passage that you brought to my heart to reflect upon for these past weeks, I pray that some lessons here would bless many lives of those present here today and those who will watch this recording. And we will be quick to give you all of the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. His name was Hacker. Uh, not as in computer hacker, but hacker as someone who hacks things down. Now, I have no idea why parents would name their little boy Hacker. But God had amazing plans for this young man's life. Later in the story, he's given another name, Jerubbaal, which means one who contends with Baal. But we know him by his first name, Gideon, the Hacker. As I began to read the story of Gideon again, as the Spirit of God said, Derek, because the Lord of the harvest has thrown you out into his harvest, into this new assignment with Hope Channel, there are some lessons I want you to learn from the story of Gideon. And so I took my Bible, and if you have your Bible with you, we're beginning in Judges chapter 6. I took my Bible... And as I began an initial reading of Gideon's story, there were two important insights that I learned. Firstly, Gideon was fearful. Gideon was what? Fearful. fearful. When the angel came to him, uh, to announce that he, the Lord was with him, where did the angel find him? <laughs> did the angel find him standing boldly in the field of wheat with a sword strapped to his hip in the face of his Midianite oppressors, threshing the wheat? Answer? He was hiding in an abandoned wine press trying to thresh wheat with nobody seeing him. Gideon, first glimpse, was fearful. When the angel of the Lord told Gideon that he needed to tear down the altar to Baal at his family house and to cut down, that's where the name hacker comes from, to cut down the pole the idol to Asherah, the Canaanite goddess, Scripture records in verse 27 of Judges 6, he feared his father's household and the men of the city. So as I begin to read about this uh, man, Hacker, the first thing that impressed me was that he was fearful. I see that fear rise again in chapter 7 of Judges when the Lord said to him in verse 9, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, what did the Lord say to him? If you're afraid, do what? Go down to the camp with Purah, your servant. 
and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Notice the next part of the verse. Maybe you missed it before. Then he went down, what does it say? With Purah. If you're fearful, the Lord said, take Purah. And Gideon went down with Purah to the camp. The first thing I learn as I read the story of Gideon is that he was full of fear. I don't know about you. Have you ever had times when, when inner fears or outward anxiety held you back from being all that God wants you to be? The woman of God, the man of God he wants you to be, maybe more concerned about what people think than what God thinks. If you've ever felt fear sometime hold you back and you said, Oh Lord, take away my fear that I can be strong and courageous. Gideon, he understood. He struggled with fear. There's a second insight I learned from an initial reading of the story of Gideon. I say the Lord is trying to teach me a lesson here, maybe a lesson for you too, when he calls you to do something extraordinary for him. Gideon was full of fear, and secondly, his faith was weak. His faith was weak. The angel of the Lord, Judges 6, verse 12, said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, verse 13, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. The Lord has what? Forsaken us, forsaken us Gideon said, and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Does this sound like a man full of faith? Amen. No. He's full of fear, and his faith is it's weak. The Lord has forsaken us. Well, Gideon turns to the angel of the Lord and says, I need a sign that you're actually who you say you are. The Lord, the angel of the Lord says to him, put an offering on a rock. And now I want you to notice, maybe you didn't see this before in verse 21. The angel of the Lord, chapter 6 of Judges, verse 21, put out his staff that was in his hand, touched the meat, and the unleavened bread, I don't know what it says in your Bible, mine says, and fire rose out of the rock. That sounds pretty dramatic, doesn't it? I mean, we know Elijah saw fire coming down from heaven. This fire is coming up out of the rock. Your faith is weak, Gideon. Let me show you I'm who I say I am. And fire comes out of the rock and consumes the sacrifice. You say, well, that ought to be enough. But Gideon comes back again in chapter 6, verse 36. If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, that ought to be enough, as you've said, but, but if you'd save, I, I'm going to put this fleece on the floor. And in the morning, do you remember? Do you remember that story? In the morning... I want the floor to be dry and the fleece to be wet. And the Lord does not argue with him and say, well, I've already shown you that I am the one and you will deliver Israel by my hand. Gideon comes back the next morning. That fleece is so wet, it says he could wring a bowl full of water and all around it's dry. Now, I'm amazed that the Lord didn't get upset with him. The Lord got upset with Moses when he kept arguing, didn't he? But Gideon says, well, my faith is weak, but I'm going to ask for another sign. Now I want the floor to be wet and the fleece to be... Are you not amazed at the patience of God? 
You know, it is remarkable. My wife says, Derek, why do you always tell people that you're not that strong and not that smart? Because God uses weak, fearful people to accomplish his work. If we will do what God asks us to do, all of us do something. Well, Gideon says, I need another sign. So he comes the next morning. The fleece is dry and the floor is wet. Now, he didn't have the audacity to ask for another sign, but the Lord actually gave him a sign that he didn't ask for. You see, God, even when our faith is weak, he will give us the evidence that we need to be strong and courageous for him. Amen? Amen. He's so good, isn't he? The Lord says, uh, arise, go down into the Midianite camp. Verse 13 of Judges chapter 7, when Gideon had come there, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I've had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Did that dream come from the Lord? Yes or no? Absolutely. The dream came from the Lord, but this man doesn't know what it meant. A barley loaf rolling into the camp. What's that? But there's another part to the miracle. Verse 14, Judges 7, Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And from that additional supernatural revelation... Gideon goes with courage. I am just so thankful today that God can take fearful, weak faith people and empower them to do a mighty work for him. Aren't you thankful for that? Total member involvement is not saying, well, just have the strong do the work and we'll sit there and clap for them. God wants to use you to change the world. God wants to use you to do something that no one else can do. And what impresses me about this fearful, weak faith man is in spite of his fear, he does what God asks him to do. Amen? In spite of his weak faith, he'll go not with 32,000 or with 10,000, but with how many? 300 against 120,000. That's outnumbered 400 to 1. And they don't even take weapons, at least. And I don't know. You've got a pot and a torch and a trumpet. I suppose you could hit someone with your trumpet. But I think that God is saying, the battle is not yours, it's God's. But he wants to use you to join him in his harvest work. Gideon goes, and the battle is won. And that's all I remember of the story as a child. I guess that's a nice place to end. But there are two insights at the end of the story which I want to draw your attention to. I think they come to me as warnings from the Lord, and perhaps not just for me, but for all of us, in Judges chapter 8. There's some good news and some very bad news at the end of Gideon's story. Having trusted God and obeyed him and God working a great deliverance through him and the 300, verse 22 of Judges 8, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. What's wrong with that statement, by the way? 
Well, I want, to, I want to affirm Gideon at least for responding, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Amen? Amen. But he should also have said, and by the way, it wasn't me. It wasn't me and the 300. It was the Lord who worked in spite of our frailty because we were willing to trust and obey. I learned that song when I was little. They don't sing it much anymore. Trust and what? Obey. That was the key right there. It's just three words. Trust and what? Obey. He wasn't that strong, but he decided to what? Trust and what? Obey. Yeah, he, he struggled with fears, but he decided to what? Trust and he should have said, you know, I'm not that strong. It was the Lord's victory. But we decided to what? Trust and obey. and obey. He said, I'm not going to rule over you, the Lord. He is king over us. But then comes the bad news. Verse 24. Then Gideon said to them, the men of Israel, I would like to make a request of you. Be careful. I, I would like to make a request of you. What's strangely missing from that comment? The Lord has this word for you. This is what the Lord wants us. No, no. I would like to make a request of you. And what is the request? that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. For they had gold earrings, because they, that is their enemies, were Ishmaelites. This is how they carried their, their uh, bank accounts. They'd taken that, having killed their enemies. They answered, we will gladly give them. They spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. My Bible says that's about 43 pounds. By today's gold rate, that's a little over a million dollars. You say, oh no, you sound like Achan. You remember Achan in the story of Jericho? You sound like Achan, told to give all of the glory to God, not take the spoil, and you're wanting the gold. I wish that's all it was, though that would be serious enough, but something even worse happens. He takes this gold. Scripture records verse 27 of Judges 8. Then Gideon made it into an ephod. What, my brothers and sisters, is an ephod? Help me, what's an ephod? An ephod was the garment that the priest wore, right? Why did he make a golden garment of a priest? Had the Lord asked him to do that? What was he thinking? Do, I mean, do you remember how easy it was to take a symbol like the snake on the pole? They ended up calling it Nehushtan and worshiping the snake on the pole. You remember that? Why does he make this golden ephod? I have no idea. But the Bible says he set it up in the city of Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there. They began to worship this golden symbol. It became a snare to Gideon and his house. I said, Lord, why do you want us to reflect on the story of Gideon? What, what lessons do you have for me? What lessons do you have for us this morning? And I'm saying, well, this man was certainly full of fears and his faith was weak. But in spite of all of that, he decided to trust God and what? He believed that God wanted to use him to make a difference for the kingdom of heaven. So he decided to trust and obey. Even when he was afraid, even when the obstacles seemed overwhelming. But I want to just bring you to the end of the story. Because when you decide, and what a wonderful thing it is that we're being called to total member involvement, that we all have a work in, in, in doing the harvest work, but I want to tell you, the devil will be there to attack you if you decide to be part of the 300. 
the devil will try to distract you with temporal concerns, with fame or fortune. I learn as I read the end of Gideon's story that we must determine to be faithful to God in every aspect of our lives. Amen? Amen. We're not talking about earning our way to heaven. We're not talking about salvation. That victory has already been won through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we're talking about joining the Lord of the harvest in his work. You think the enemy is going to sit around and admire us? When the Lord throws us out into his harvest, he says, I throw you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Determine that you will honor God in every aspect of your life. Determine that you will trust and obey him even when you're tempted to be afraid. Determine that you will trust and obey him even when you are fearful and you feel that the enemy is too big for you. Determine that you will trust and obey him even if your family, by the way, I know the father says, well, let Baal defend himself, but, but he doesn't defend Gideon very much. Even if your family doesn't come to your aid, trust God and obey him. Amen. And if we will do that, I believe that the great victory won back in the book of Judges, where God can use a little band. You see, I think the 300 is a symbol of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Hopelessly outnumbered. Limited resources. Not that strong. But if we will trust God and obey Him implicitly in every aspect of our lives, He will use us Amen. to accomplish His great victory. Do you believe that? Amen. I want to appeal to you this morning if you want to be part of that Gideon's band. I'm talking about those who will trust and obey. If you'll say, Lord, I want, to, I want to be involved in your work, and I choose today to, by your grace and the power of your spirit, to honor you in every aspect of my life, I want to invite you as we pray to stand. Is there someone that say, I want to be part of that band? Amen. God bless you. People are standing all over this congregation. Maybe you're watching this recording. You're standing in your living room, wherever you are in your church. God is raising up a people who will trust and obey and be involved in his work. And when Satan throws snares at us, we will not compromise in any area of our lives. We will honor him in all things. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lessons from Gideon. We are amazed that you would look at someone who was so fearful and whose faith was so weak and you would still see in him someone you could use in supernatural ways. And oh Lord, we have courage to believe that you see us that way too. That you have a plan for us not just to be saved, as wonderful as that is, but you have a plan for us to join you in your harvest work. You have a plan for us to participate with you in the miracles that you will perform in these last days of earth's history. We're standing, Lord, not because we feel we're stronger than others or that our faith is, is somehow superior to others. We're standing because we're willing. And I pray, Lord, that you would throw us out into your harvest. You'd put us where you want us to be. And when the miracles happen, when the victories are won, we will be quick to give you all of the praise. And day by day, by your grace, we will honor you in every aspect of our lives. We pray this and we thank you. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please.
Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. Let us bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you care so much for us. We thank you for the friend in Jesus that we have. And we thank you for the reminder this morning about the importance of trusting and obeying you fully and completely. And we pray that you will help us to 
avoid the pitfalls that Gideon uh, fell into, that we may be faithful to you and be a part of Gideon's band in the end. And we just are grateful that we can be here, that we can hear how your work is going forward around the world and uh, to sing praises to you and to study your word. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.